Hey everyone, if you're a longtime listener, you might recognize this episode as one we did many years ago when we first read Dune by Frank Herbert on this podcast, but we are actually remastering and re-releasing the entire Dune book club series for new fans who are diving into the books after having watched Denny Villeneuve's blockbuster films. So whether you are a longtime fan and you're re-listening to this series, Or if you're a new listener who just picked up the book for the first time and are looking for a spoiler-free guide through the world of Dune, we welcome you, and we're so excited that you're here. Thank you so much for listening. As we always say, there is no real ending. And today we live up to those words, (laughs) refusing to let this book club die. Welcome to Gom Jabbar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. My name's Leo. And Leo. Yeah. Once more, onto the (laughs) breach, sir. We're we're ending this again. (laughs) The final. (laughs) Now the third time. Because yeah. we lied to that one time and yeah. then split the last one in two. Yeah. And then we're like, wait, we're going to do one more. Anyway, we book club dead. Track record. <laughs> we promise this is the final, final, final episode of our book club coverage of the first dude book. It's true. On our last episode, we finished. Finally, we finished yeah. the book. We got to the last page. We talked so much about some of those final scenes. Yeah, definitely. Now, before we get into what today's episode is about, just a reminder, a little bit of housekeeping, as always up top. As we prepare to get into book two, which we officially announced in the previous book club episode that we will be continuing into the next book and beyond. Oh, yeah. As we prepare to jump into Dune Messiah, we want to hear your thoughts. So as a reminder, you know this email by now, you've heard it. (laughs) <laughs> Dozens of times. Yeah. Gomjabar podcast at gmail.com. Reach out to us, share your thoughts, share your excitement for Dune Messiah. And of course, send us your questions, many of which we'll be tackling on today's episode. Today's episode's a first. Yeah. We're going to be doing a mixed spoiler and spoiler free episode, which just sounds like a terrible idea, but <laughs> we're going to handle it in a way that I think makes sense. We are going to be 100% spoiler free until the first ad break. And yep. we're going to, leading into that ad break, give you lots and lots and lots of uh, warning. Because afterwards, we are going to be talking more deeply about pretty much all of Frank's books and the, the way that this first novel really launches this ship, so to speak, this highliner. <laughs> Definitely. You will have ample warning. So do not worry. Okay, so the first half of today's episode, we will be catching up on a ton of emails and messages that we've gotten from all of you, our wonderful listeners. So we will be starting today's episode with an extended mailbag section and addressing a lot of the comments and questions that we've gotten over these past few months as we have read this first book that we just haven't gotten around to or had time to cover in those episodes because those episodes were (laughs) were already so long. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So these are the questions that we didn't have a chance to answer that we will do so today. Man, I just realized we could have been branding mailbag as distrans this whole time. Oh my gosh. Damn it. (laughs) Uh, We'll do it for Dune Messiah. (laughs) Yeah, we'll do okay. More (laughs) we'll be more branding opportunity. That's like figuring out Spice Morsels seven episodes in. God, we're bad at this. (laughs) Now, after the mailbag section and after that first ad break, where we warn you and give you plenty of notice, we will be jumping into our deep spoiler discussion of the first book as a whole. Right. So if you wanted a deeper dive discussion of Dune and its place within the larger saga and some spoilery stuff that's in future books, second half of today's episode is for you. 
indeed it is. So, with that, you know what, Abu? A bat just arrived. I just spit in oh. its mouth, as I was supposed uh-huh. to. And yep, yep. as is tradition. As, as we are supposed to, according to bat facts. <laughs> we've got some distrans. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Well, we'll, we'll workshop it. We'll talk about it. We'll workshop it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, stay tuned. We have had some absolutely incredible emails over the last, really over the last year. And we start off with an email that we received from David. Cartar, Carter, Cartar. Sorry, David. Uh, <laughs> There's two T's. It's really there are us two off, T's. David. <laughs> it's a cool name, but <laughs> yeah, confusing because yeah. we're bad at names. <laughs> Had a couple of fantastic questions. So here's the email. Dear Abu and Leo, I am so grateful for your podcast. I was a huge Dune fan as a teenager in the '80s and channeled my heightened imagination into drawings of still suits and ornithopters and maker hooks, most of which are now lost. I even wrote Frank Herbert in 1982 and received a brief but gracious response. Sadly, that letter, too, is lost since 14-year-old me failed to protect it as the sacred relic it was. Oh, my God. (laughs) As an aside here, I'm so sorry for your loss. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, heartbreaking. uh, Hindsight. Hindsight 2020. (laughs) All right. David goes on to ask, what does it say that Frank's world is an unquestionably male-dominated hereditary monarchy? His female characters are strong, dignified, and self-possessed, but he never allows them to assume positions of political leadership. So, does this suggest that Frank failed to foresee a future with any planets ruled democratically, or with women in any positions of leadership, or did he discount the possibility as ultimately against human nature? David's second question here comes a little bit later. If the Emperor supports the Harkonnens' plans within plans to take over Arrakis, why did he even bother taking it away from them and granting it to the Atreides? Wow, two really great questions. Yeah, and they make perfect sense. You know, reading through the book, it, it, definitely I've had those exact thoughts. Mm-hmm. So, to answer your first question regarding women in positions of power within Dune, we can't, kind of as we have in the past, speak to Frank's intentions as an author. Of course, we've lost the opportunity to ask him about what he intended. So we can't speak fully to his intentions as an artist, or even that his stories are representative of his personal beliefs. But as with our conversation regarding the kind of giver's takers speech from Paul, it is just possible (laughs) that Frank had some old fashioned notions about the world. That being said, that being said, I actually don't think that that's the case. And I actually kind of disagree that he that he specifically doesn't allow women to assume positions of political leadership in Dune. We actually get a direct explanation from Jessica to Thufir about why the Bene Gesserit don't simply, like, take over everything, right? Yeah. Quote, How easy for her to shape a human tool to thrust into an enemy's vitals. True, Thufir, even into your vitals. Yet, what would I accomplish? If enough of us Bene Gesserit did this, wouldn't it make all Bene Gesserit suspect? We don't want that, Thufir. We do not wish to destroy ourselves, she nodded. We truly exist only to serve. End quote. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I love that. <laughs> Even yours. <laughs> it's like, wow, okay. Right. Your vitals aren't safe, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I tell my friends that all the time. So in this explanation, she is claiming that the Bene Gesserit truly are servants, but We do know from a broader perspective of Dune that the Bene Gesserit serve humanity, so it really is they are kind of an independent faction with their own goals, right? Yeah. He wrote a world that regressed to this sort of patriarchal feudalism, but it's also very clear, to me at least, that the men who are in power are only in power because the Bene Gesserit have put them there, basically, or have allowed them to be there. And that makes sense to me, considering if you look at who dies in the first book, good Lord, it's all the guys in power. Yeah, yeah. The Bene Gesserit are behind the throne, like, wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Wouldn't catch me on that chair. Are you kidding me? It's terrible. Right. They like their role as puppet masters pulling the strings. Yeah, totally. Like, they are ultimately more in control than pretty much anybody else in the grand scheme of things. Exactly. And, you know, all of that isn't to discount what David wrote. Right. 
it is true that this is a very patriarchal system. 100%. The yeah. people in power are men. The emperor is a man. The dukes are powerful. Jessica isn't even a duchess. Right. She is one of the main female characters in the first Dune book that we meet, and she is still an unmarried concubine to the Duke Leto Atreides. So she doesn't even get that title. So yeah, like we aren't discounting the idea that Frank built an empire and a universe and a story in which characters live in a very patriarchal society that is still male dominated. That is 100% true. It's just important to also take the larger context of the story and particularly the Benny Gesserit's role in the story and realize that they are actually quite powerful and choose themselves to stay in the shadows and work from the shadows. Right. They don't want to be emperors. Right. It's true. Now, to your second question, sort of why the juggling of planets if the emperor is just going to help House Harkonnen reclaim Arrakis, we have to kind of revisit Piter's master plan and the kind of broader conspiracy that launches this whole book. The emperor wants Duke Leto out of the running for the throne because Duke Leto is just getting more and more popular and the emperor does not want any kind of threat or any perceived threat to his claim on the throne, right? On the golden lion throne. Leto's enemies, House Harkonnen, bring him a plan. They're like, yo, Pretend to give him Arrakis, right? Pretend to give Arrakis to House Atreides, lure them there, and then before they can kind of get a good foothold, we'll uh, borrow some of your super elite, you know, SEAL Team 6 soldiers, yeah, and we'll go fuck them up and destroy this political rival that you have, which then to the Emperor, sounds great. What a great plan. Exactly. And, you know, in addition to just getting rid of Duke Leto because of his rising star on the political stage, right? Like, beyond Duke Leto just being a political threat, we learn later in the book that House Atreides, because of Duncan Idaho and Thufir Hawat and Gurney Halleck, have been able to train soldiers that rival Sardaukar in battle. Yeah. So in addition to being a political threat, Duke Leto and House Atreides are also a military threat to the emperor and his entire rule. That's a huge threat, and the emperor's got to squash it somehow, some way. Right, yeah. I would also add, it really the timing of they have to have moved, but they still haven't fortified their like control of the area is crucial, you know? Yeah, that, that's so true. Imagine taking Usain Bolt off of the racetrack and telling him <laughs> to climb him out. Like, yeah, he's see how be fast out of you his... are now. Go up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You're fast on flat ground. Wow. So impressive. <laughs> Here's some rocks. Fastest Dude, man best. on earth. Cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Today on Gamjabar, we go for Usain Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> Just unnecessary shots at Usain Bolt. <laughs> he, he, we miss because he's so fast. <laughs> oh man you're absolutely right there's also a there's just like a home field a home turf advantage and it just makes no sense to attack right. the atreides on kaladin displace them disorient them and then attack them right yeah what a great set of questions from david yeah and we hope uh our answers sufficed and uh we threw in a little bit of usain bolt shade for you too david <laughs> yeah <laughs> we did if, if his people email us and they're like, why, why the fuck are you attacking Usain Bolt? We're going to blame you, David. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> you now have a new uh, enemy in the world. And, and, he's, and he's the fastest man he's alive. the fastest man. You fucked up, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't know if that's a great strategy to get people to email us. <laughs> <laughs> Just... Turn we'll answer emails. your questions, but we'll threaten your life. <laughs> we will put you in mortal peril. Just <laughs> find exceptionally dangerous people. And <laughs> no, by all accounts, by the way, Usain Bolt's like the nicest dude. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to chase you down because you dropped your wallet and he's going to catch up to you. It's great. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
Next up, we have an email from Hector Mariani. What is your take on the throne room by the ending of Dune? When Hawat asks Jessica to forgive him and there is not a clear reaction from her. I say this because some people believe she ignored him or didn't care or forgave him. In my opinion, it was overwhelming stuff to even react to. Or Frank Herbert just lazy wrote that paragraph to give way to the arc of Paul. End quote. <laughs> hey, look, we all have our slow days. <laughs> we all have our slow days. It is funny because in the last episode of the book club, we kind of joked about that. You know, this stoic non-response. And I kind of right. made a quip about that. So, you know, great minds think alike. I think you may be onto something specifically that Frank was focusing that moment on Thufir and Paul. Also, I think about Thufir's wording in that moment. Quote, Lady Jessica, I but learned this day how I've wronged you in my thoughts. And other things, dude, come on. You needn't forgive. <laughs> End quote. Thoughts and actions, Thufir. Jesus, Lord. Yeah. It's okay. He forgot. But a half-assed apology. <laughs> But, Just because there's poison coursing through your veins and okay, you're on the verge you're of death. dying, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fastest man on the planet. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. From those, that wording, although it's kind of <laughs> falls short of really apologizing, it also doesn't really sound like he's seeking out any response from her. He's not saying, Jessica, do you forgive me? He's going, yeah. You need not forgive me. I was a fucking idiot. Right. I, I really think she's probably at this point like, okay, noted. I, I got you. You know, the read receipt. She read the message. Just doesn't feel necessary to say anything back. Yeah. And I've also always sort of had the impression that through fear and Jessica have more of a professional relationship. You know, yeah. like we both sort of work in this house and we got a job to do. You got to remember that the fear likes to call Benny Jesuits witches like he already <laughs> has sort of a built in bias against Jessica and her people. Right. So you can imagine that, like, I'm sure they weren't super buddy, buddy friends. Right. And uh, I think Jessica is at least here in this final scene as well within her rights to just kind of stay quiet and not offer any any forgiveness for the way that the fear acted. And I think the reaction to Gurney was different because her friendship with Gurney was much more intimate and much more personal. That's true. Again, she she talked about how, hey, you used to play the ballast for me and it was lovely. Can you please do that again? Clearly, their friendship was much deeper than Jessica and Thufir. So the different response there makes sense, at least to me, in my head canon. Yeah. And to be clear, I'm not necessarily saying that she and Thufir were friends, but yeah, that idea of like a colleague or a professional colleague. I think you, yeah, that's a perfect way of putting it. They're coworkers and they don't particularly like each other. So, you know, he sent her a kind of not great email and she's just not going to respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. And it's cool. You know, again, I agree. I would not have faulted her for some fucking, I told you, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Fuck you. You know, wouldn't have held that against her. I think it would be totally deserved. But that being said, you know, bygones are bygones. And uh, that's the scene. Yeah. Okay, next up, an email from Ori Kagan. This one's pretty quick. But amid some very, very sweet words, thank you, Ori, for all the compliments. Ori asks, where is the miniseries love? <laughs> And we did respond to Ori via email, but we figured many of our other listeners might be wondering the same thing. Yeah. Because we have almost never talked about the miniseries on this podcast yet. It's true. And that doesn't mean we haven't seen it or know of its existence. <laughs> we just haven't talked about it yet. We just haven't <laughs> talked about it. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, there was a sci-fi miniseries adaptation that originally aired in the year 2000. It can be a little bit tricky to track down. You might have to rent it or buy it somewhere, have it mailed to you. But it is so much fun. It's like, I love it so much. And we will talk about it one day. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it, as you can probably tell. And there is a lot to say, so much to gush and, and just 
fun over because it really is a very faithful adaptation. And there are times that it's like not great, but I love it. I personally love it so much. So thank you again, Ori, for the email. I mean, honestly, it was just incredibly nice. And it, it really does mean the world to hear that people enjoy what we make. It's, it's almost, uh, almost makes up for losing all of our friends and family because all we talk about is two. <laughs> <laughs> right. Again, our listeners are all we have left. <laughs> Moving on. Next email is from Craig Fisher about the Chinese trailer for the upcoming movie. Yeah. Craig writes, guys, guys, did you see that Chinese trailer? Guys, guys, did you see that? <laughs> what a great email. Short yeah. to the point. And uh, Craig is not wrong to be excited. That Chinese trailer slaps. Yeah. <laughs> it is so much better than the, than the U.S. trailer that I'm kind of offended. We see so much more in the Chinese trailer. I mean, we get the shot of the worm rider. Yeah. We get thumpers dropping that fat beat. True. That we mm -hmm. all love so much. Thump, thump, thump. <laughs> we also get a much better look at the spice harvester scene, which yeah. you, I believe, have actually already seen in the IMAX preview, at least part of. Yeah, and I never stopped bragging about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Tells everyone he knows, folks. Now, <laughs> that scene looks glorious. And personally, it's one part of the book that I am so, so excited to see on the big screen. So it was, once again, oh, totally. cool to see more of the Spice Harvester scene and that worm that quickly approaches and consumes it. So cool. Now, in the Chinese trailer, something new that we got was a very quick glimpse of the Hunter Seeker. Yeah. The Hunter Seeker scene early in the book. And I love the design. It looks very insect-like, which is very close to how it's described in the book. Right. And it looks pretty size accurate as well. It's very small. So I love that they took the book description quite literally with its design here. Especially, I mean, the size. Because I remember reading it and going, oh, it's this sliver of metal. Like it's this very small and then the Dune Encyclopedia says that hunter seekers are like millimeters long. Like they're very yeah, small. Tiny. And then you look at the 1984 David Lynch movie and it's like <laughs> a remote control for a TV. It's like so big. <laughs> it's like, and, how could you miss that? And cool, but also, you know, not quite accurate to the book's description. Yeah, it looks good. And it once again, we talked about this in our trailer breakdown episode a while back but just the attention to detail from this team from this creative team yeah inspires confidence in us these folks know what they're doing the fact that the hunter seeker looks so accurate to the way it's described in the book the worm rider the thumper like everything is just so accurate or at least interpreted in a way that makes sense and updates it in a way that makes sense it's incredible it inspires confidence and my hype for the movie is astronomical right now it, it's i can't even put it in words i am just on the edge of my seat waiting to go finally freaking see it <laughs> <laughs> soon man soon soon the final email that we're going to share today is another quick one from craig jorgensen craig writes hey gents just sending a note of appreciation for your cast i've been a longtime lover of the dune saga I recently came across your cast and I've been trying to devour your content in a few days. I especially liked your insights in the Mentat episodes around Thufir, about how his age or prejudice could have been the reason for his miscalculations about Jessica. Also, the cast as a whole has great audio quality and flow. Thank you for doing what you do, and I look forward to your thoughts on the new movie. Oh, ah, so nice. So nice. Too nice, frankly, you know? I don't know what to do with all this affection. Stop. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> don't. Please don't. It is wonderful and, and meaningful to get specific positive feedback that way. Really, thank you for the email. Um, uh, we've said it before, but it's worth saying again. You know, Abu and I, we work really, really hard to make this as good as we possibly can. Right. And uh, even when a, a single episode can take upwards of 30-ish hours of work, it is a joy and it is a journey that I think I can speak for both of us in saying that we are glad to be on, but even gladder when we hear that other people like it too. And it's not just us and our microphones and our dark little booths. <laughs> yeah. 
All righty. So that wraps up the first half of today's episode. Thank you, as always, for all of your emails and messages and notes and D strands and the one guy that sent us a carrier pigeon. <laughs> so lovely. Yeah. We love to get it all. And please continue to do so. And if we missed your email today, don't worry. We will be answering questions in future episodes as well. So we'll catch you on the next one. But for the folks who wrote in for today's episode, thank you so much. We love to hear from you. Now, before we move on to our next segment, right? a couple of warnings. Warning number one, we are now transitioning into the spoiler-heavy portion of the episode. So if you don't want to be spoiled for anything beyond the first student book, now's the time for you to pause, go read all the uh, five. Go. Go. <laughs> Go read all five books as quick as you can and then come back and hit play. Yeah. We'll still be here. We promise. It's how podcasts work. <laughs> exactly. And warning number two, ad breaks coming up, folks. So after the break, we will be diving deep into our spoiler discussion of the entire first book and jumping into some of the big themes and characters and moments that we loved so much. We'll be right back. And welcome back from that delightful little break. Now, we've each selected two of our favorite kind of themes or ideas or quotes or kind of through lines that start in Dune and go throughout Frank's books. Yes. Now, before we jump into our picks. Yes. One final warning to be extra, extra sure. Yes. This is about to be crazy spoilery we are going to take into account the entire dune saga and that means all six books written by frank the larger dune canon explored in the dune encyclopedia and maybe even some of brian's work so if you are not ready for spoilers into any or all of that now's the time to pause go read and consume all the dune content out there in the world and then come back and hit play <laughs> okay i'll kick it off my first pick for a major theme that I wanted to discuss more fully and in spoiler fashion is the tragedy of Paul Atreides. Mm. Now, I am so, so, so excited that we are continuing this book club into Dune Messiah and beyond because not only is Dune Messiah my favorite book in the series, which is a bit of a controversial take, yeah. apparently yeah. a lot of people dislike the book. I'm hoping that our book club can convince you otherwise. <laughs> But I'm also excited because Dune Messiah, frankly, <laughs> is required reading as far as I'm concerned. You must read Dune and Dune Messiah to fully understand Paul's legacy and Frank's story. The themes that he's trying to convey and get across don't fully land in the first book. There's a lot of setup that continues in Messiah and ultimately concludes in Children of Dune, at least in regards to Paul himself. So really, you know, I, I say this as a huge Dune fan, you should read all of it, but Dune and Dune Messiah together, I think, are so, so important. Too often that first book is misinterpreted as just a generic hero's journey where right. Paul does the classic hero's thing and has conflict and overcomes it and finds new powers and then wins in the end. But that's really not the case. We talked a lot about this in the previous book club episode, but Paul survives and conquers at the end of that book he does whatever he needs to to manipulate the fremen and take power from the emperor and we see a number of red flags in it, both his character and in the way the book ends particularly in that final chapter again we talked at length about that in book club nine so i will try not to repeat myself too much so let's talk about the tragedy of paul atreides what I find so fascinating and dark and just poignant is how so many of the lines from the first book just take on this new meaning and depth once you know what happens in Messiah and Children of Dune. Once you learn about what Paul's 12-year reign is like. Right. The quote that I continue to come back to time and time again, I've mentioned multiple times over the course of this book club, is this thought that Paul has when he learns about the death of his first son. Quote, how little the universe knows about the nature of real cruelty. End quote. Ugh, what a good... Ooh. Yeah. 
knowing what happens in Messiah and knowing about Paul's jihad and then what takes place in Children of Dune, this line sends shivers down my spine. Yeah. It's so much more powerful when you know what comes next. Particularly once we learn more about Paul's jihad in Dune Messiah. In Messiah, Paul compares his body count with... Which, which to be clear for you, Generation Yeah, Z, not, not that not body the number count. Of people not that separate. body count, right. <laughs> I think that's two, one? Johnny? <laughs> Johnny, yeah. yeah. Yeah, as far as we know. <laughs> we need to go through... <laughs> do body counts on we every... need to do body counts for every major character holy shit <laughs> that'd be such a I mean dumb... the number is astronomical for Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho Duncan Idaho right? <laughs> <laughs> he keeps coming back to keep fucking <laughs> one life is not enough he's like on his deathbed oh I'm sorry there's more ladies to sleep with I <laughs> bring bet. me back <laughs> see you soon <laughs> <laughs> Bring me back to Lailaxia. They're like, yo, word. Our face dancers are learning so much. Oh my gosh. Yeah, not that body count. In Messiah, <laughs> Paul is talking about the number of people that have died either directly or indirectly by his hand or by his command. Right. And he compares himself to um, notable bad dudes, Genghis <laughs> Khan and Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Who, according to the book, killed 4 million and 6 million people, respectively. Right. Now, Paul tells Stilgar and Corbett in this scene, quote, oh, fuck Corbett. At, a conserv- <laughs> <laughs> at a conservative estimate, I've killed 61 billion, sterilized 90 planets, completely demoralized 500 others. I've wiped out the followers of 40 religions, which had existed since, and then at this point, Corba, that piece of shit, interrupts Paul. So Paul doesn't get to finish his thought. 61 billion deaths under Paul's rule, under this jihad. And a reminder, this is a jihad that is being kept in check by Paul Atreides. Because at his core, Paul is a good person. And throughout much of the first book, he is attempting to find a path into the future that doesn't involve this jihad. Eventually, he resigns himself to the idea that the jihad will happen and decides, okay, the best way for me to stop it or control it or minimize its damage is to take power, is to be in a position where I can control it and direct it. Imagine an absolutely wild jihad that spread without Paul's control yeah, and was let, let loose by that fucker Korba, <laughs> you know? Ugh. That 61 billion would be the starting point of that jihad. It's absolutely insane to think the astronomical numbers that we're dealing with in this galaxy, how widespread the jihad is and how many people have lost their lives because of it. And that weighs on Paul's conscience. He's so despondent throughout Messiah. Like, yeah, the whole book, he's like, oh, fuck, (laughs) everything sucks. Can't make any changes, you know. Not only would it have been way worse with someone else at the head of it, using Paul's death as like a martyrdom or something. Yeah. It's also would have been tacky. (laughs) (laughs) Banners would have been ugly. Corbett just would have fucked it up somehow. That idiot. Yeah, totally. He sucks. He doesn't know how to brand it properly. Terrible branding. That guy. (laughs) (laughs) Now, this, of course, this jihad, Paul's rule, is the quote-unquote terrible purpose that we hear about so early in Dune. Like, within the first couple of chapters, right? we hear about Paul's foreboding, how he feels this terrible purpose weighing on him, but doesn't quite know what it is. And, of course, by the time we get to Messiah, by the time we get through Children of Dune, we know that this terrible purpose that Paul felt so many years ago way back in Kaladin, when he first met Moheim and underwent the Gamjabar test, is not only this jihad that will be unleashed on the galaxy in his name, but also the burden of his role in guiding it, the blood on his hands of all the people that were killed by it, and of course, the lives of all those people weighing on his conscience. That is Paul's terrible purpose. That is his tragedy. That is his destiny. And frankly, a thing that he is unable to stop in his lifetime. Right. It's really, really sad when you consider the events of the first book through that lens. 
And it's important to point out that so many of Paul's decisions in that first book are almost a direct response to this jihad that he continues to glimpse over and over again. As he sits in Arakin Palace after his great victory over the emperor, we get this quote. Muadib, from who all blessings flow, he thought, and it was the bitterest thought of his life. Uh. They sense that I must take the throne, he thought, but they cannot know I do it to prevent the jihad. End quote. There it is in plain text. Yeah. The jihad is the reason he took power in an attempt to stop it or minimize it. Fortunately, as we learn in Messiah 12 years later, there's only so much damage control he could do. Right. So to wrap up my first point here, in short, Paul is a tragic figure. He is still our hero, but that does not mean he went on a hero's journey and that it ended well. And I think by the time you get to Children of Dune and that just gut-wrenching, pivotal scene where Paul, as the preacher, talks to his son, Leto II, who has begun by that time his transformation into what will ultimately become the worm god. Right. There are some heart-wrenching passages back and forth. Right. There's a quote. If I'd only died, Paul whispered, I truly wanted to die when I went into the desert that night, but I knew I could not leave this world. End quote. And of course, he's talking about the end of Dune Messiah, where he right. walks off into the desert. Tragic stuff. The weight of everything. His powers, his rule, his responsibilities, the blood on his hands, all of that has just weighed Paul down his entire life. That confrontation with his son, actually, in the desert, he is begging Leto not to go through with his plan to become the god emperor, to become part worm, to follow this golden path, glimpses of which Paul himself has seen. And Leto responds with something that is just heartbreaking, and I can't wait to get to that in our book club series. Quote, You didn't take your vision far enough, father. Your hands did good things and evil, end quote. And that right there, in just two sentences, is an apt summary of Paul's life. He had these powers, he had these visions, he didn't quite know what to do with them, and like Leto says, he didn't take them far enough, and in the end, he did both good things, great things, terrible things, and evil things. It's a, it is such a heartbreaking scene, and it's so tragic, yeah. All right, Leo. I'm excited for your pick. What did you go with? Well, uh, for my first pick, I'm going to be talking for the next 25 minutes about <laughs> the best character in Dune. And that character is Clarebee. <laughs> Clarebee. I'm just kidding. No, the bus driver for the Bene Gesserit doesn't appear in the first book. I'm joking. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. That, that should be retconned. <laughs> Can we retcon that, please? <laughs> He's like a... <laughs> Just a cart cart driver, and that somehow he's 4,000 years. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Of course, so my first pick is politics, especially with the Bene Gesserit and how that kind of solidifies between this book we just finished and Chapter House. To start this conversation, in the very first pages of Dune, in that first conversation with Moheim, we get this quote. We have two chief survivors of those ancient schools the Bene Gesserit, and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasizes almost pure mathematics. Bene Gesserit performs another function. Politics, he said. Kol Wahad, the old woman said. She sent a hard glance at Jessica. I've not told him, your reverence, <laughs> Jessica said. I don't think <laughs> It wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me. The Reverend Mother returned her attention to Paul. You did that on remarkably few clues, she said. Politics, indeed. The original Bene Gesserit school was directed by those who saw the need of a thread of continuity in human affairs. End quote. Wow. Very perceptive of young Paul. Very perceptive of young Paul. Also, if you read Dune, and then Messiah, and then Children, and then God Emperor, and then Heretics, and Chapter House, man... That word politics is thrown around so much in Heretics and Chapter House to literally then be at the very beginning of Dune rereading and to have Paul be like, politics, and the Reverend Mother freaks out. She's like, what the fuck? He knows our secrets. No, it's 
incredible that so early in the journey, we get this little spark, the beginning of what ends up this big blaze of ideology. Yeah. And throughout Dune, we can kind of draw a strong line, connecting a few kind of declarations surrounding that word, kind of politics, especially as a means of control. We get a foreword from Irulan prior to the, uh, the first worm ride chapter. Quote, you cannot avoid the interplay of politics within an orthodox religion. This power struggle permeates the training, education, and disciplining of the orthodox community. End quote. And even from one of the appendices, we have a lesson that Jessica quoted earlier in the book. Quote, when religion and politics ride in the same cart, when that cart is driven by a living holy man, nothing can stand in their path. End quote. Wow. So, obviously, those are some very specific moments where this word is thrown around. But taking a step back, looking at Piter's plan to trap the Atreides, that whole scheme is soaked in imperial politics. So, let's, what I want to do, <laughs> this is a lot of quotes, but bear with me. I like these <laughs> books, okay? <laughs> let's look through the six books at how the word politics comes up again and again and again. In Messiah, the goal of hate, a.k.a. Duncan Idaho, a.k.a. fucking all the time, his body count's <laughs> insane, astronomical. Insane body count. Insane body count. He's kind of flirting with Alia, you know, this courtship, this strange courtship, by just savagely dunking on her and her brother's upbringings, if you could call it that. Quote, you were conditioned to an overweening thirst for power. You were imbued with a shrewd grasp of politics and a deep understanding for the uses of war and ritual. End quote. Which is amazing. Just got saying, em. got him. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> like you were raised to be manipulative and to grow your power and influence. Yeah. Next up, in Children of Dune, we get this quote from the Bene Gesserit training manual. Quote, governments, if they endure, always tend increasingly toward aristocratic forms. No government in history has been known to evade this pattern. And as the aristocracy develops, government tends more and more to act exclusively in the interests of the ruling class, whether that class be hereditary, royalty, oligarchs of financial empires, or entrenched bureaucracy. End quote. Ah, one of the best quotes in all of Dune. I love it. Like I love when Frank gets political. <laughs> I love it. Puts on his political hat. It's like, let's go. That's so <laughs> dope. Yeah. No, I mean, between the first pages of Dune and this, we're really starting to see throughout the book about how kind of the Bene Gesserit sisterhood is focused on politics as a core educational topic. Yeah. From God Emperor of Dune, we get this incredible quote from Leto II's stolen journals on the topic of politics slash government and his golden path. Quote, The pattern of monarchies and similar systems has a message of value for all political forms. Governments can be useful to the governed only so long as inherent tendencies towards tyranny are restrained. Monarchies have some good features beyond their star qualities. They can reduce the size and parasitic nature of the management bureaucracy. They can make speedy decisions when necessary. They fit an ancient human demand for a parental or tribal feudal hierarchy where every person knows his place. It is valuable to know your place, even if that place is temporary. It is galling to be held in place against your will. This is why I teach about tyranny in the best possible way. By example, knowing my message, I expect you to be exceedingly careful about the powers you delegate to any government. End quote. Oh my God. Late Get so political. Too, you arrogant <laughs> bastard. Ah, you worm. <laughs> <laughs> Moneo. Moneo. <laughs> oh my God. gosh. I love when Frank gets political. That's such a good point. What a brilliant quote. Oh. There's so much. I mean, that quote alone is worth like picking apart for like a whole episode, but so much in that in that one lengthy paragraph. The book club for God Emperor is going to be so wild. Yeah. And then we have all of the rest of the books. Yeah. Heretics 
and chapter house. Like I'll, I'll be honest, as I was going through, you know, the, the beauty of eBooks is that you can just word search. What I've quoted thus far is kind of, it is almost exclusively what is explicitly said. But as a theme, this idea of politics explodes in the last two books in a way really kind of hard to fully encapsulate here. So I'm not going to try. Let's just finish off this point with, uh, with a couple of quotes and with a couple of notes here. Now, to start off, heretics, just the whole premise of the book, is literally following Bene Gesserit sisters who deviate from the political religious marriage within the organization. The established politics of the Bene Gesserit, well, they're going to change those or go against those, that sort of thing. And Chapter House sees some of those same heretics finding success as they rebel against that established method. And really, at the end of the book, launching the Bene Gesserit into a new state and, of course, also crowning Clareby as best boy because he's <laughs> the best. I love him. We can kind of drive this point home by jumping into a specific moment in Chapter House where Odraid is in a position to make some big decisions. Here is the quote. Reaching beneath her table, Odraid touched a call field. Her two counselors stood silently waiting. They knew she was about to say something important. Politics, Odraid said. That snapped them to attention. A loaded word. When you entered Bene Gesserit politics, marshalling your powers for the rise to eminence, you became a prisoner of responsibility. You saddled yourself with duties and decisions that bound you to the lives of those who depended on you. This is what really tied the sisterhood to their mother superior. That one word told counselors and the watchdogs the first among equals had reached a decision. End quote. There it is. Politics. One word. <laughs> She's going to say something super important. What she can say. Politics. You don't need to say anymore. We get it. It's wild. Like that's a whole idea encapsulated in one word. Dune is just an absolute blast for the subtle snark, the literal knife fights, the uh, technology, the glow globes, the blaze guns, Gamont, best planet, Gamont, Gamont. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the poisons, the not so subtle dunks on Irulan, and we're here for <laughs> Irulan, it's fine. But it is really a masterpiece in the way that it handles themes like politics introduced in the very first book and then explored thoroughly through those last few installments. Yeah, truly. Politics, again, if there were pillars that held up the Dune saga, one would be religion, another would be politics. <laughs> yeah. It's so core to everything in these stories. And half the characters go, you said two pillars? I only see one pillar. Sorry, politics and religion are different? I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I see them as the same... Uh, I think they should probably be the same. <laughs> right. Separation of church and state. What, uh, Get the fuck out of my office. Get the fuck out of here, Thufir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so, Abu, that's my first pick. What's your second pick? Well, the second idea that I wanted to explore and talk about today is a bit smaller than the first one. I wanted to just touch on some of the Leto 2 foreshadowing that happens in the first and second book before we even get to God Emperor, before we even get to Children of Dune, where Leto II plays a more central role. There's quite a bit of foreshadowing to later events. And it's fun to sort of go back and point these things out once you sort of know about the wormy future that is inevitable for humanity in this galaxy. Yeah. So in the first book, at the very end, in the final chapter, Paul tells a distraught Chani who is still mourning the loss of her firstborn. Quote, he cannot be replaced, but there will be other sons. It is Usul who promises this. End quote. Now, obviously, some of our more astute listeners and readers of the book might note that he uses the plural sons here. But as we know in future books, Leto II is the only son that he has. Ganema is the other child that he has, and that's his daughter. I imagine that this quote in particular, he cannot be replaced, will have other sons, I promise this. I imagine this is Paul sort of bullshitting 
And it's a bit of a white lie just to comfort her in this moment. Obviously, losing her firstborn is devastating for Johnny and for Paul as well. Right. And he's just sort of telling her the most comforting thing at this moment, the right. thing that will help her the most to hear. But again, Paul, Kwisatz Sadarak, prescient abilities. I'm sure <laughs> that he has actually seen many different futures with many different possible children. Could be one, could be two, could be seven. He could be on that TV show with eight children. <laughs> it could be an infinite number of possibilities. Our Octo Life or whatever. <laughs> right. that show? The Octo Quiz Ads or something. <laughs> I don't know what that show is. Oh my God. The Benny Jesuit hate to see it. <laughs> They're like, oh fuck it, how many kids? <laughs> <laughs> that is eight times the work in our breeding program. God damn it. <laughs> Now, the more interesting foreshadowing that we get for Leto 2 is in Dune Messiah, in the second book, when Paul is talking to Chani and he says, quote, I promise you a thing, beloved. A child of ours will rule such an empire that mine will fade in comparison. End quote. Wow. Uh, yeah. That is shocking stuff to hear, considering Paul is literally the ruler of the known galaxy the head of a jihad that killed 61 billion people and is effectively a god to billions of people across the galaxy. Pilgrims make the trek to Arrakis just to hear him speak. Right. And half the time it's Korba. <laughs> and, right, half the time it's Korba in like a shawl and a hood and hiding his face. From a distance. Is that you know, kind of, yeah, it's him. I mean, I, th I thought he'd be taller. He has his arms out, though. Like, that's what he does. That's his thing. So, <laughs> and like, not it. Like, you try it. Yeah. So, you can't. You can't do the arm thing the way he's doing it. Right. Right. It must be. It, it's got to be. It's got to be more deep. It's got to anyway, be. Did you bring your Sharpie? Because I fucking forgot mine. <laughs> I hope he signs my breasts. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He's still doing that like years later. <laughs> so tired of it. His body count might be small, but his breast count, oh, <laughs> I love this quote so much from Messiah. Our child will rule an empire greater than mine. Especially, once again, knowing what it comes in later books, knowing that right. compared to Paul's 12-year rule, Leto, his son, Leto II, will have a 3,500-year rule yeah. as a literal god, as a huge worm god-man who is so prescient and so powerful that he brings the galaxy and some of the most powerful political players to their knees. Yeah. So he's not wrong here. He is glimpsing some of that future empire that Leto II will rule as God Emperor. He's seeing what may come to pass for his children. It's wild stuff and yeah. some really incredible foreshadowing for God Emperor of Dune. Okay, Leo, let's wrap up this spoiler deep dive discussion. You have one more idea that you wanted to dive into. I do stagnation as Ooh. the ultimate threat. So if you've found yourself scratching your head at the impossibly dense idea of the golden path from, you know, Children of Dune and God Emperor of Dune, the word stagnation probably haunts your nightmares as much as it does mine. <laughs> yeah, all the time. The, uh, every night, someone's like, ooh, stagnation. And I'm like, no, <laughs> wake up swing. <laughs> the word comes up casually throughout Frank's books, but whether it's kind of in that nuanced interplay of Amtal and Amtal role, that idea of challenging oneself to discover your true nature and safety in an individual's life, or even the broader kind of threat to all of humanity, this dark end of civilization. The idea of stagnation is fascinating, and especially in the kind of final chapters of Dune. To be clear, in those final chapters, Paul could have let Gurney kill Fade. Paul could have used the Bene Gesserit safe word, pineapple, to <laughs> kill Fade, basically, to earn a moment of guaranteed victory during that life and death battle. And finally, he gifts Shaddam with the worst punishment he can conceive of, the removal of hindrance. Go to that planet, we're going to make it a paradise. The removal of Amtal and the decline of the Sardaukar. In all of these examples, Paul is making the decision to test himself and the people around him 
in order to determine the true nature of things and to put, to move forward into a future that's worth being in. Like that whole scene is a decision nexus. He's not sure that he's going to survive. He's seen many, many, many versions of that uh, play out where he dies, but he knows that safety and knowing that he would survive and guaranteeing that would breed stagnation, which is worse than death in many ways. Right. So looking for the word stagnation in Dune, I am, as always, shocked at how early it comes up. Really, really early on, we get an exchange between Jessica and Moheim. Quote, I ask only what you see in the future with your superior abilities. I see in the future what I've seen in the past. You well know the pattern of our affairs, Jessica. The race knows its own mortality and fears stagnation of its heredity. End quote. Now, not only is this one of the first hints of Moheim's literal prescient abilities, so, you know, see our Moheim episode for more on that topic. Right. But this is also Moheim saying very early on that stagnation is kind of a grand threat to humanity. Mm -hmm. And anyone with prescience has seen how much of a threat it is. Oh, totally. Yeah. You look forward and you see that as a possibility. You will do everything in your power to prevent it. We get a forward from Irulan, and there's this reflection on Paul's decision-making process. Quote, And always, he fought the temptation to choose a clear, safe course, warning, that path leads ever down into stagnation. End quote. Yep, there it is again. There it is again, from Paul himself, right? Seeing the future and going, no, I can't do that. As tempting as it would be to know that I'm going to win this knife fight. I can't do it. It's not an option. We learn in Children of Dune that Paul was seeing the golden path, but he couldn't bring himself to choose it. Nevertheless, he was kind of actively keeping that future open enough so that Leto too could kind of knock, knock that shit out of the park. For the next 3,500 years. <laughs> o- only o- home runs. <laughs> only home runs. His batting average is somehow in the millions. And it's not how that works, but... Listen, the rules change when you're covered in sand fucking makers. Little when you're caught with sand trout, when you're covered in sand trout, the rules don't apply. Yeah, truly. But we also get this very specific reflection on the semi prescient steersman towards the end of Dune. Quote The guild navigators, gifted with limited prescience, had made the fatal decision. They'd chosen always the clear, safe course that leads ever downward into stagnation. End quote. Uh, I love that so much. It's so good. I mean, considering their prescience doesn't go nearly as far as that of Paul or Leto II or even maybe Moheim, you can't really blame them for not spotting the extinction of literally all of humanity in their actions. Right, right. yeah, to be fair. You'd think that they would probably change their business plan if, uh, <laughs> if that was the case. But it's a haunting moment, especially reading that little passage considering literal fucking futars from the scattering, <laughs> honored matres, all of the shit that goes down to know that the guild steersmen are just blind to that. And even so, those things, the futars, the honored matres coming back, those are parts of the golden path that lead into the only existence of humanity. It's yeah, insane. It's insane. I love this quote from Paul so much because it fits thematically with so many other ideas in Dune, right? Yeah. We've talked time and time again about how the Sardaukar are the most feared fighters in the galaxy because of how rough Seleucus Secunda is, how brutal that planet is. The same thing for the Fremen. It's the deep desert that has made them into such strong survivalists and warriors. Right. It's adversity and overcoming adversity. It's Amtal and idea that we dedicated an entire episode to that creates a better, brighter future. So Paul here saying that the guild has only ever used their prescience to play it safe, to take the course that's most obvious, to take the easy path. That's a way towards stagnation, never challenging yourself, never pushing what can be or should be, never questioning the status quo, just continuing along the path that is safe and easy. 
that's so thematically consistent with many of the ideas in Frank's books. This idea that you have to push yourself to be better, to carve out a future that's better for you and everyone. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, there. this is part of why it stuck out to me, because it is this sort of core theme that Frank maintains, evident in some very pivotal moments. We don't really get the word stagnation again until Children of Dune, but this is between Paul and Leto too, as they're having their sort of faded conversation out on the sands. And Abu, I'm going to have tag you in for this. Oh, uh, love it. Because this is a very back and forth quote. Gotcha. Put me in. I'll, yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be Leto too, because I'm a letter off. And uh, you'll be Paul. And you are two letters off. But <laughs> that's not good casting methodology. Doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Thousands of peaceful years. That's what I'll give them. Dormancy. Stagnation. Of course. And those forms of violence which I permit, it'll be a lesson which humankind will never forget. I spit on your lesson. You think I've not seen a thing similar to what you choose? You saw it. Is your vision any better than mine? Not one whit better. Worse, perhaps. Then what can I do but resist you? Kill me, perhaps? I'm not that innocent. I know what you've set in motion. Ah, so oh my good. god, fuck me. Huh. so good. There's also a little section there where Leto kind of says, you could fall on your knife if you don't want to see how things are going to play out. And Paul's like, no, I know how you would use my body to like make this happen even faster. Right. And Leto's like, yup. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that path too, you little twerp. All right, Dad, you caught me. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to use your corpse. <laughs> what a conversation. I mean, it's an incredible moment, and we really do get a full sense of the vision that Paul had but couldn't commit to. We also get confirmation of Leto II's acknowledgement that a controlled stagnation would be exactly the catalyst necessary to save humanity from any number of threats, right? Yeah. The idea of building up that tension on a galactic scale, make people feel that stagnation in their bones over thousands of years so that they never once stay still again. Insane. So cool. Yeah. You got to boil the water to make mac and cheese. <laughs> you got to subjugate humanity to make the a brighter future. <laughs> the analogy sort of falls apart, but you get what I'm saying. Velveeta is the sponsor <laughs> of today's Golden Path. <laughs> <laughs> Just like their golden cheese, you too can take a bite I, out of the Golden Path. It's so yummy. I literally thought that's the direction you were going. Like, oh yeah, because mac and cheese is golden and, and maybe I'm a little bit hungry. Maybe that's what's happening. I'm starving, yeah. Well, it really strikes me how much this theme, which ends up being central to the next 20 years of Frank's writings, is talked about literally on, I don't know, the 40th page, 50th page, like real early on. Yeah. Long story short, I'm starting to think that Frank Herbert guy can write a good book. I think, <laughs> I think he's pretty good. Yeah. Y you he might be should... something someday. You should keep you it think up. on his behalf we should submit some of these for Hugo Awards? I think he's got a fighting chance. I, you know, if nothing else, like amateur writing competitions, probably. Yeah, definitely got those yeah. in the bag. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, all right. Well, that concludes our spoiler discussion of the first book. Obviously, we didn't touch on everything. Obviously, we wanted to, but that's for future book club episodes, folks. We will be going through all six of Frank Herbert's novels. That's actually an announcement that we made in the last book club episode. And we just want to reiterate it and make it official here once again. If you haven't heard, shout it from the rooftops, folks. <laughs> we will be continuing this book club series. We've wrapped up book one officially as of today. Promise. Ten part series for the first book. Promise. There won't be an 11th. And very soon, we will be continuing into Dune Messiah. We are already 
starting preparations and planning to jump into Dune Messiah in much the same way that we covered the first book. And in fact, we're going to have some more concrete details for you in seven days. Next bum, week's bum, bum. episode. Bum, bum, bum. We're going to be announcing some really exciting things on the next episode. So do not miss it. You know, about the future of Gamjabar, what our plan is, and some pretty big things. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to announce some really cool things next week. Just to give you a little hint for those of you that have made it to the end of this episode. A yeah. little treat. Some of the things we're going to announce next week, they happen to rhyme with the words perch, Splurge. nook, blub, oh. and flareon. So <laughs> stay tuned. We're releasing Jolteon. <laughs> Jolteon, Umbreon, any of the yawns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, stay tuned, folks. Next week, some pretty big announcements about the future of this book club and the future of this podcast. Look to our coming at the first light on the seventh day, folks. At dawn, look to the east. Oh, I love Harry Potter. <laughs> we'll see y'all It's Luke next Skywalker, week. you dummy. <laughs> it's, it's, Yoda said that in Star Trek, you idiot. <laughs>